Welcome. How does one create and sustain a field of knowledge? The gamble of the Pirzada family has been that you do it by recognizing the best of scholarship, by cultivating the scholars, uh, by creating incentives to promote and grow and transform scholarly fields. Uh, and critically here in relationship to uh, Prophesying. Um, I'm delighted and honored to welcome you. My name is Lawrence Cohen, I'm the director of the Institute for South Asia Studies at Berkeley, to the inaugural uh, giving of the SS Prasada Dissertation Prize in Pakistan, uh, to welcome uh, the donors, to in a second welcome uh, our uh, honored speaker uh, and her discussant. The, um, and, uh, but officially I'm here to do two things, which is first to ask you to turn off your cell phones, um, and second to welcome my esteemed colleague, Munus Faruqi, um, the co-director of the Pakistan Initiative at Berkeley, um, um, who has been along with the Prasadas behind this event from the get-go, and central to its inspiration. Um, uh, I will only therefore say before I turn it over to uh, Munus, um, that it is a particular honor uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Abbas, uh, who will be presenting a paper um, in a few moments, uh, and to listen to two of my colleagues who are part of the uh, committee uh, for this prize, describing her work uh, in sheer ecstasy. Uh, it is uh, a great sign for the future of this prize. Uh, and for the future of the of the commitments behind it. Thank you very much to um, uh, the Prasadas. Thank you very much to our speaker, to the committee, Professor Bakle, who has kindly come to uh, discuss this, and to Munis Faruqi. Thanks. Uh, before I begin, could I ask everyone to put their cell phones off, uh, lest we have a meeting in the middle of the event itself? Okay. Um, good afternoon. Assalamualaikum, Namaste, Satyaka. Allow me to begin with a confession. Today may well be one of the proudest days in my academic career. Even if, God forbid, I do nothing more in the years and decades ahead, I can always remind myself that I was part of the team that helped establish the Sayyid Shamiuddin Bizarre Dissertation Prize in Pakistan Studies. This dissertation prize honors the best doctoral work relevant to the study of Pakistan in the humanities, social sciences, education, and law. It is open to anyone who has completed a dissertation in the previous year in North America or Europe. To my mind at least, the momentousness of today's celebration stands out for a whole host of reasons, including the efforts of many individuals who either helped set up the prize, participated in the selection of its first recipient, or masterminded today's event. At Berkeley, I want to give a specific shout out to Dr. Sanjita Saxena, Dr. Lawrence Cohen, Dr. Sabah Mahmood, Dr. Raka Ray, Kunita Kala, Manali Shep, and Nina Gupta. At Columbia, Dr. Manan Ahmed, and at UC Irvine, Dr. Farooq. I mean, can I please ask any of the above mentioned who are present to stand up and acknowledge our applause? <laughs> the momentousness of today should also be judged by the brilliance and hard work of Dr. Ambar Abbas, the richly deserving recipient of the inaugural Bizarre Dissertation Prize. Can I please ask Dr. Abbas to stand up and acknowledge our applause? <laughs> but we wouldn't be here today but for the extraordinary qualities that Mr. Rafat Pizada and Ms. Amna Jaffer, the donors of the Pizada Prize, have brought to the table. Few people approach this couple's levels of approachability, intelligence, selflessness, and above all, generosity. I'm not sure how many of you have had a chance to work with donors, but let me just say it's almost always tough work. Invariably, things get complicated because of diverging intellectual visions, desires for control, and questions of accountability. 
Thankfully for us, these were never issues when working with Rafa and Amna. They mostly left things to our charge, trusting that we would do right by them, by Berkeley, and the cause of Pakistan studies. I hope they are not disappointed. Can I please ask Rafa, Amna, and their sons, Kehan and Shamil, to stand up and acknowledge our applause. Most of all, the momentousness of today should be judged by what we expect the Sayyid Sharif the Pizada Dissertation Prize to do in the years ahead. As the first and hitherto only dissertation prize to focus on Pakistan in the US, or anywhere else in the world for that matter, we hope it will encourage intelligent scholarship on Pakistan or the region that is Pakistan, draw attention to that work, and also foster additional intellectual and professional opportunities for prize recipients who in turn, someday, hopefully, will pass it forward to the next generation of Pakistan scholars. In many ways, the values of the Bizarre Dissertation Prize match those of the person after who it's named, Sayyid Sharifuddin Bizarre. The father of our friend and patron, Rafat Bizarre, Sharifuddin Bizarre was born in Burhanpur, India in 1923. After receiving his legal training at Bombay University and the Lincoln Center in the United Kingdom, Sharifuddin Pizada served as a personal secretary to Muhammad Ali Jinnah in the late 1940s. In a career that has spanned the entire life of Pakistan, Sharifuddin Pizada has emerged as one of the leading constitutional scholars of that country. He has also held a whole host of appointments, including Foreign Minister of Pakistan, three stints as Attorney General of Pakistan, Secretary General of the Organization of Islamic Conference, and Chairman of the UN Subcommission on the Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities. These appointments have been matched by various honors, including Pakistan's highest civilian award, the Nishani Ayaz. Throughout his long and, yes, occasionally controversial career, Sharifuddin Pizada's friends and detractors have disagreed over many things. There is remarkable agreement, however, about Sharifuddin Pizada's love of intellectual pursuits, he is the author of 10 books, his intellectual generosity, his understanding of the importance of education, and his commitment to public service. It is these very values that undergird and drive the Pizada Dissertation Prize. As many of you already know, the Pizada Dissertation Prize is the latest in a series of endeavors aimed at making Berkeley a center for conversations and learning about Pakistan, as well as creating a $300,000 endowment aimed at ensuring that beginning, intermediate, and advanced Urdu are taught every semester and every year into the future. The Berkeley Pakistan Initiative has successfully set up an intensive Urdu language program in Pakistan that is run in collaboration with the American Institute of Pakistan Studies and the Hall University of Management Sciences. The inaugural batch of six US-based graduate students completed the first cycle of this program in December 2014, and we excitedly anticipate seven more students to participate in the second round of this program later this year. Every fall, we also host a Habib Distinguished Lecture Series, whose aim is to give interesting voices on Pakistan a forum at Berkeley. Since its inception in 2012, we have hosted the lawyer and human rights activist Asma Jangir, as well as the scholar of the Pakistani military industrial complex, Aisha Sadiqa. These conversations come on the heels of so many others. This semester alone, for example, we have hosted half a dozen speakers and two major conferences, the first on education and the other on security in Pakistan. On that note, it is with the greatest sadness that I inform you that one of the participants in the Berkeley Security Conference held in late February, Sabine Mahmood, the human rights activist and founder of T2F in Karachi was shot and killed yesterday. <laughs> Besides being one of the most fearless and selfless people that I've ever known, she also was distinguished by an eternal optimism and belief that Pakistan's better angels will reveal themselves if only given half a chance. 
If nothing else, may her death spur us to deepen our commitment to further as well as more textured conversations about Pakistan. With Sabine in our minds, can I please request a 15 second silence in honor of her memory. It now gives me the greatest pleasure to introduce the first recipient of the Sayyid Shalini Pizada Dissertation Prize in Pakistan Studies, Dr. Amr Abbas. Dr. Abbas got her undergraduate degree at Duke University and her doctorate in the Department of History at UT Austin in 2012. Her dissertation is titled Narratives of Belonging, a Leader Muslim University and the Partitioning of South Asia. At present, Dr. Abbas is an assistant professor at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, where she teaches classes on South Asia, world history, and oral history. Dr. Abbas's research primarily focuses on the period of transition associated with the 1947 independence and partition of India that ultimately resulted in the creation of three separate states, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. Her research looks specifically at the graduates of Aligarh Muslim University in India who had been students in the 1940s during the run-up to independence and partition. These students were active in formulating and spreading expectations about Pakistan and the future of Indian Muslims that remain relevant in South Asia today. To avoid affording us a better sense of who Dr. Abbas is, <clears throat> what makes her tick, <clears throat> I thought I would do something slightly off the beaten track. Given that Dr. Abbas did her dissertation in Texas, I thought I'd ask her some Texas-related questions <laughs> and share her answers with you. And so here goes. Question number one. What is your favorite Desi restaurant in Austin? Her response, my kitchen. <laughs> and uh, to those of you in the know, she makes a wicked curry, so if you're ever next in Philadelphia, visit her. <laughs> Question number two, who is your favorite rodeo star? <laughs> Her response, what? <laughs> Question number three, what do you think of Ted Cruz's chances of becoming the next president of the United States? <laughs> Her response, too high for my comfort. <laughs> Question number four, should we mess with Texas? Her response, absolutely not. <laughs> Following Dr. Abbas's talk, my friend and colleague in the Departments of History and South and Southeast Asian Studies, Professor John E. Barclay, will serve as a commentator and discussant of Dr. Abbas's work. I'd like to thank her in advance for generously agreeing to do so. I know my schedule is very tight. I will now ask Dr. Abbas to come to the podium. The title of her talk is Fear and Belonging, the Spectre of Violence in the Liga 1947. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here. I have so many people to thank, I can hardly even stand it. Um, and so I probably, I'm going to do my best to thank all of them in the right order, but many of them have already been thanked, so I won't make them stand. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, most importantly to thank the Prisada family for endowing um, this prize. It's just really a tremendous thrill for me to be here. Um, also to thank the prize committee who read my dissertation, which as any graduate student knows is sort of a that's like the holy grail that someone needs your dissertation. So now several people have read it. Dr. Brackley told me she read it too. It's kind of, I just think it's amazing. Um, so many thanks to the staff of the Institute for arranging my whole visit. They've been um, putting up with me every day. Please invite this person and please invite that person. So they've been very, very generous with their help. Um, and to all of you for coming on what has turned out to be just an extraordinarily beautiful afternoon. To the Metcalfs for coming, um, that's just really special for me. I come from an, an intellectual lineage of which they are a big part. So um, I will be presenting some uh, work that is adapted from my dissertation. So in, um, it relies heavily on the oral history collection that I created um, in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh between 2005 and 2010. Um, and, but I'm going to start by backing up just a little bit from there um, in, as a way of kind of getting in, thank you, to 
thinking about Aligarh Muslim University during the period of um, the mobilization of the demand for Pakistan and the period of partition um, in India. So in 1947, Muhammad Ali Johar, the tireless activist for Indian Muslims and an Aligarh old boy, that's what they call them even if they're women, um, declared in a letter to the, the Raja of Mahmudabad, one of the institution's patrons, that Aligarians would sooner, quote, give up Aligarh than the dreams that they had dreamt there. Thirty years later, Aligarh students faced precisely that dilemma. For more than a decade, they had been so closely aligned with the movement for Pakistan that its herald, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, had called them the arsenal of Muslim India. In 1947, Pakistan was to be created, but Aligarh was not to be in it. Would it be possible to give up Aligarh and hold fast to the dreams that they had dreamt there? So I've selected a few excerpts from um, the over 70 or so oral history interviews that I collected in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh from former students of the Aligarh University to demonstrate why I think that um, the experience of partition in Aligarh was unique, but remains key to understanding the experience of partition in the subcontinent. And I should note that, you know, I've already mentioned women, I did interview women as a part of my collection, um, although the university was officially an all-male environment prior to 47, and so the evidence that I'm drawing on today is really from those young men, former students, who um, were there in 46 and 47, um, and many of whom passed out in the years um, immediately afterwards. I draw on an archive of spatial experience that emerges in these oral narratives, again collected between 2005 and 2010, from former Aligarh students that I argue expose the extent to which experiences of fear and belonging were at the heart of their concerns during partition. Many of the narrators I interviewed ground their partition experiences in the physical spaces of Aligarh and its surrounding landscape. For these narrators, partition forced a re-spatialization of their daily life and memory. In constructing the world that they live in, when they talk to me about their memories of being at the institution, they describe those sites that were later disrupted. In other words, their narration of before partition and after partition is pulled through particular sites of memory. And those are sites of, of everyday experience, cafes, movie theaters, the hostels that they lived in on the campus. And they are precisely located in a larger remembered landscape at which Aligarh occupies the center. Though I will argue that Aligarh and the university are key sites of meaning in the history of the Indian partition, I think it's really important to bear in mind that they are distant from the borders that were drawn through Punjab and Bengal, dividing India and Pakistan into separate states in 47. Um, so Aligarh is about 90 miles southeast of New Delhi. Partition scholars have under long understood that official archives could only tell part of the history of partition, and so they turned to oral histories. But as um, Joya Chatterjee has pointed out, these ground-level histories continue to focus overwhelmingly on the border in Punjab, to the almost total exclusion of the unique circumstances of the Bengal borderland, and I would argue any site beyond Delhi that is not a border at all. Aligarh persists as a key site of partition not because of its location, but because of its meaning as a place. For Aligarians I spoke to on all sides of partition's borders, the university is a powerful site of continuity with their pre-partition lives, irrespective of whether they chose Aligarh or the dreams they had dreamt there. In Aligarh University, the trauma of partition is distinct from the experience of violence. <coughs> but intimately connected to the fear of violence and the experience of disruptions to place, especially the university's ability, and sometimes inability, to extend a care piece of protection over its students. It was the disruption of this protective power that traumatized Edgar students and left them feeling exposed during and after the process of partitioning. Partition disrupted the institutional underpinnings of daily life leaving participants disoriented as dreams were both realized and deferred and familiar worlds were rendered strange. So the Aligarh Muslim University was never attacked during partition. Despite this absence of violence, 
This paper explores the role of fear in rearranging the relationship between Uyghur students and the world around them. While students were acutely aware of discrimination and the ostensible threat of communal riots, it was not until 1946 and after that they experienced actual fear for their personal safety. The absence of violence did not limit partition's impact in this environment. For as Bangladeshi scholar Mehna Mukhathakurta has suggested, quote, the fear of being dispossessed, the fear of not belonging, caused people to flee, even if they had not witnessed a single act of violence. So Guhathakurta obviously, or maybe not obviously, but I should mention, is speaking about 1971 um, and the Bangladesh war. And it may be a piece of um, analysis that fits a little bit uncomfortably in the discussion of the Pakistan movement, but I think that the reference points that she uses for thinking about fear in 1971 are actually quite relevant to this environment. The violence that altered Aligarh Boy's view of the world was, in Guhatta Kurta's words, not to be measured by external acts of murder, loot, or abduction, but the feeling of being out of place when the social and moral practices that defined their sense of belonging were disturbed. The sense of vulnerability evinced by the transgression from belonging to being out of place created a new paradigm, one governed by the fear of not belonging in a place where one had always belonged before. So a little bit about Alighur. Um, many people here may be familiar with it, but just um, a little bit of context. The institution that became the Alighur Muslim University was first established in 1875 on a plot of sort of desolate land north and east of the Hindu majority city of Alighur. Its founder, the visionary Muslim reformer Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, intended the residential institution to serve the sons of the Muslim elite and to prepare them for colonial service. Any of our students, um, I, love Sir, I love the picture of Sir Sayyid, his beard is so famous. <laughs> um, any of our students were recognized as boys of good breeding who were engaged in a project of character building alongside their education. A private sphere bound, uh, oh sorry, the geography of the college mimicked the courtyard homes of the Indian elite a private sphere bounded by walls that physically shut out those who were not eligible to this access, to this elite environment. And this is a picture of the university's original hall, the Sir Sayyid Hall. These walls also, and critically, kept the boys in, where they could be monitored and disciplined into men. The campus has always been somewhat separate from the city itself, and I have a couple of maps I'll show you later, connected by a bridge over the railway tracks known as the Kutpula. The founder felt that placing students in this isolated environment where they lived and ate and played together would encourage in them a feeling for the importance of the community. Like their understanding of family, but without the mitigating customs that he believed the boys were exposed to in the Zanana, or the women's quarters, and that threatened their character development. The residential system was the core disciplinary regime. As Vice Chancellor Aftab Ahmed Khan wrote in 1926, it was the most distinctive and the most important feature of our institution from its very start, a system which is best calculated to develop and bring out all that is best in human nature. Hundreds of young men coming from different and distant parts of the country and representing all sorts of ideas and manners, virtues and vices, if kept under a proper control and effective discipline, gradually evolve into a corporate life and character which leads to success. But if they are left unregulated, and uncontrolled, the result must be disastrous. Dun, dun, dun. Um, the uniform of the black Sherwani, and yes, I do know that this is made of wearing a Sherwani, but it's such a lovely picture, I thought I, I shouldn't pass it up. The black, the, the Aligarh Sherwani is a high collared, slim black coat worn with white trousers, shoes, and socks. The shoes and socks were critical to the Aligarh code identified Aligarh students as members of this selective community, making them recognizable to each, each other and to the public at large. They wore the Sharwani on campus, and when they ventured outside the university's bounds to the cinema, to the adjacent city of Aligarh, on the train to their homes, Aligarh boys' prestige was evidenced by their smart uniform and backed by the history of the institution. All the students wore the same uniform, and that's kind of important because although it was a primarily Muslim environment, there were always non-Muslim students um, as a part of the community, but they all wore the same uniform. 
So as one former student told me, looking from every angle you can see that he is from Alibur. <laughs> one narrator told me that allegiance to the welfare of the university was the common thread that drew the students together as they were all concerned to perpetuate the good name of the alma mater. The university's regulatory capacity was upheld by the proctorial system of discipline. Run by university staff and assisted by students, its purview extended beyond the bounds of the campus into the railway station, the cinemas, and cafes in Alibur City. Students were required to adhere to the disciplinary norms of the university, even in those places, and wardrobe or behavioral violations were punishable by fines. So by our standards, this sounds incredibly restrictive, but some of the former students, many of them, remember with a tremendous amount of pride that, as Dr. Ali Khan told me, the whole system was organized, the policing of the university system, by the students and the staff only. No police were involved. They were so competent that no quarreling was going on, and the proctors were all students. Many students refer to the disciplinary environment as a key aspect of the university's celebrated mahol, its atmosphere. The proctorial monitors, as they were known, were selected from among the senior students and were responsible for maintaining student discipline on university grounds and off. This disciplinary environment was linked to a sense of brotherhood, of shared experience. As such, it bred a powerful sense of collective identity closely associated with the notion of belonging to the institution. As a place, then, Unigar was defined by its moral order that was, in the words of geographer Doreen Massey, constructed out of articulations of social relations and imbued with history. For its students, Unigar was well established as a place, that is, a location that was bounded by meaning. Its physical and emotional boundaries were coterminous with those of home. The authority of its faculty was equivalent to that of parents and similarly challenged. That's something that gets left out in some of the conversations about Eligar. I have some great stories about the mischief they got into. Um, and its role was not only to educate, but to protect and guide. Still, the work of Massey and other social geographers has expanded the definition of place to show that articulations of the local are intimately connected to the world outside, that the boundaries of places are defined by the ways in which they connect to the space beyond. In Aligar, prior to partition, I believe that there were, for Aligar students, there were three concentric circles of meaning and protection. The campus, defined by the boundary wall, and this is a, a recent uh, map. The town of Aligar, including the railway station, the movie theaters, and the cafes that was defined by the extension of the proctorial system. And then the region around the campus, the Muslim-influenced towns of the United Provinces, including Agra, Bareilly, Delhi, and the students' homes. So even though these places are far from the boundaries that define partition, and even the violence that took place there, the challenge of partition in Aligarh was also about boundaries, about space and place, and about the fear and threat of violence, that, that, that violence might breach the boundaries. And when it did, it pushed the students from those outer circles into the institution, from where they later had to renegotiate pathways into the world beyond. These places are not high-profile and disturbed sites like Delhi and Punjab, but these oral history narratives show that their inhabitants nonetheless faced significant choices about belonging. The question to me about whether a place was disturbed or not is not only about physical violence, but also about the rearrangement of community patterns. As new forces and new faces came into co communities in northern India, that really changed the ways in which they operated. These changes are obvious in places like Amritsar and Lahore and Delhi, less so in Aligarh and the towns around the UP from which many Aligarians came. So Aligarh remains high profile as a site of Muslim organization, but has not previously been examined as a site of partition in part because, as every former student from that era would tell you, there was no violence in Aligarh in 1947. As a site for examining the disturbances of partition, however, it provides a helpful entry point by identifying a group of Muslims whose community was and remains deeply disturbed by the changes partition brought. So, into the stories. 
Um, prior to 1947, when Aligarh students describe their experiences, they speak of Aligarh as a place, and this is its celebrated mosque. Um, this place is filled with meaning and experience, but they also talk about the space beyond, that outer circle of protection that connected them to sites of importance in the broader region of the United Provinces. They frequently traveled throughout this region by train, and the railway station itself is a key site of memory for narrators. It was one of a few sites outside the bounds of the campus in which the university's disciplinary regime extended. It was the gateway to Aligarh, through which almost all of the students had to pass as they moved between university and home, and it was under the purview of the proctorial monitors, usually a senior student. So while the, stu while the station functioned as an extension of the campus, students frequently boarded trains without actually purchasing tickets. Many narrators refer to this as the Aligarh tradition, <laughs> arguing that between Aligarh and Delhi, for example, a distance of fewer than 100 miles, Aligarh students were not expected to purchase a ticket. So, uh, Brigadier Iqbal Shafi of the Pakistan Army told me, it was below our dignity of Aligarh students, below our dignity to buy a railway ticket to go to Delhi or Agra. It was our railway. And all these railway officials knew that these are Aligarh students, and they'll never buy a ticket, so nobody bothered. So I pressed him, what does it mean, below your dignity? What does that mean? Why should we buy tickets? We are going to Delhi and coming back. You know, Aligarh was like this hub, and on one side was Delhi, on the other side was Bareilly, and on the third side was Agra. This was a free-for-all, and nobody bought the tickets. Why should we buy tickets? We're going to Delhi and Aligarh and, you know, Bareilly. Anyhow, so that was the tradition. <laughs> Shafi's declaration that it was our railway reveals his sense that Aligarh, Delhi, Bareilly, Agra were Muslim centers, historical sites identified with Muslim power and from which many Aligarh students and professors hailed. The direct rail connection between the, place, between the cities suggested that the connection was something more than geographical. Shafi here defines that outer circle of Aligarh's sphere of influence by incorporating the whole region around it. The place of Aligarh here is defined by its connections, the ability of students to access these other sites. It is defined as a place by its location in place. Aligarh students, he felt, were entitled to move freely in this area without fear of legal challenge. He does recognize that the privilege of Aligarh students to travel these distances was not, strictly speaking, legal, but it was certainly tolerated largely because of the respect and influence that AMU commanded in the region. Ah, so there's Tana in Um Given its geographic and emotional centrality in landscapes of Muslim history then, it's really unsurprising that the party that generated a spirit of Muslim nationalism and aimed to represent Muslim interests sought to secure allegiance at Aligarh from students and faculty alike. By the 1940s, the Muslim League held political sway on the campus. The Vice Chancellor, Ziauddin Ahmed, and University Administration Cultivated links with the Muslim League allowed and often encouraged students to participate in political activities and ultimately facilitated the shift in the university's identity from a culturally Muslim one to a more politically Muslim one. In late 1938, the pro vice chancellor, ABA Halim, although the students called him Abba, meaning father, and they remember him as a real stickler for the uniform, especially the, the socks part. <laughs> Abba Halim went so far as to estimate that, quote, about 90% of the students of the university have strong Muslim League sympathies, and it is no exaggeration to say that out of 114 members of the staff, 100 at least are Muslim Leaguers. Muhammad Ali Jinnah visited Aligarh University frequently, and critically, he was there in March 1940 to make an important speech to the students just before he traveled to Lahore for the League meeting at which the Pakistan resolution was passed. Major General Ghulam Omar, retired from the Pakistan Army, remembered that during that visit, Jinnah addressed the students. And during that address, he used the words Muslim India. And one of the students got up and asked him, where is Muslim India? There are some provinces where Muslims are in the majority, four or five provinces. But otherwise, Muslims are in Bengal, in Madras, everywhere. What is this Muslim India? And Jinnah said, there is not a corner of India from which a Muslim student is not present here. This is Muslim India. Throughout the 1940s, the League developed its values among Aligarh students and elsewhere, 
And it's important to note that they took this very seriously, this role of representation, and that became um, very important in the 1940s. It was not until the occasion demanded in the 1945 and 46 elections that Jinnah moved to deploy his arsenal. In 1945 and 46, the two years preceding the formal partition of 1947, Aligarh students ventured far beyond those circles of protection as they became active in Muslim League engineering. Wearing their sharmanis, Aligarh students became the symbol of the Pakistan demand as they appeared in provinces where Muslims were in the majority, as in Punjab and Sindh, and even where they were in the minority, like UP and Assam. Electioneering work required the students to leave the campus and travel, often by train. In fact, when Aligarh alumnus Liaqat Ali Khan, who was number two in the Muslim League, dispatched the students, he kept with the Aligarh tradition and distributed only, distributed only enough money for three or four train tickets, even if the election party was a group of six or seven. The League itself depended upon the privilege of access that Aligarh students described to travel without ticket. The students joined in droves, leaving the protective environs of the campus of Aligarh of the purview of the proctorial system of discipline. And they describe a sense of freedom during that time of spaciousness that contrasts with the sense of security that they felt inside the university itself. But their emergence from its boundaries also inscribed those boundaries more clearly for the surrounding community, affirming the difference of the university as communal politics became more contentious and Aligarh boys more visible. The identity of the university became increasingly politicized as it became publicly aligned with pro-Pakistan politics. And I should also point out that um, in my interviews, I've interviewed people who had a variety of political affiliations. So while the League was sort of over, overwhelmingly dominant, it did not erase other possibilities. Um, there is a very well-known contingent of leftists and communists at Aligarh um, that were there during the 1940s. I've also spoken to a number of students who were um, active in Indian National Congress electioneering. Sometimes, um, even if their parents were standing for election for the League, the children were fighting for the Congress. The work of Aligarh students helped to secure the League victory in the elections, and they knew that their own welfare was tied to the community's fortunes. Since its founding, the students had been exalted as representing the future of Muslim in India, and Jinnah, of course, reiterated that. So Aligarh boys fully expected that they would be the leaders of an empowered Muslim community, and for them, Aligarh was its beating heart. When they returned from electioneering to find their institution more exposed and vulnerable as a result of their political work, the students established their allegiance to the institution by seeking to protect it and the dream of Muslim solidarity that it represented. They patrolled its boundaries. They kept watch from the rooftops. They rallied to defend the campus against potential attackers. There's a pervasive sense in the memories of these narrators that Aligarh was surrounded by hostile communities. Mohiuddin Khan, now settled in Bangladesh, told me that, quote, the atmosphere was also tense. Sometimes we used to feel that maybe we may be attacked by the majority, Hindu majority people all around. And at night, we used to remain very careful. In stories about this period, there's a persistent narrative of threat. But some students remember responding with a show of strength by guarding the university's boundaries. The students were determined to protect their own safety within the boundaries of the university against any threat of potential outside attack. And they never <coughs> referred to engaging the outside authorities, the police or the military, to maintain peace. Since Aligarh's earliest days, and in the memories of many of these narrators, the university's independence from civil authorities is a source of pride. But in reflecting on the events of 46 and 47, many of them refer to the deployment of, a mili of the military around the university during the disruptions. A little further investigation reveals that this deployment began in the spring of 1946. But former students credit this deployment with protecting the university from threatening mobs during the partition disruptions of 47. So the calendar of memory and reality is a little, is a little bit of slippage there. Um, as the students returned from electioneering, there was an attack on a local market in Aligarh City. As retired Aligarh history professor Irfan Habib recounted to me, in 1946, Aligarh students in a large mob went to the grain market of UP and burnt it and five villagers were burned to death. 
The conflict took place on March 29th and appears to have been an altercation between AMU students and the proprietor of a Hindu cloth shop in which the students beat up the shopkeeper. This incident sparked a riot, the burning down of the grain market and the deaths of several individuals. There's a little bit of, not all the sources reported in exactly the same way, but that's the sort of account I've been able to put together. To mitigate student threat, the government revised a riot scheme for the posting of a military police company at several points along the railway line that divided the city from the campus, including near the Katpula, that bridge over the railway tracks. These points were deemed highly vulnerable and the ones through which the students are likely to enter the city. Through which the students are likely to enter the city is a quote from the police report. The university's response to the incident was defensive. Without calling in the services of police or military, it increased its defensive power, particularly along the boundaries, by increasing the number of chokidars, or watchmen, and arming them with sticks. Further, faculty and staff were enlisted to help in patrolling the area with guns and being present in batches of two every night. Despite the fact that Aligarh students instigated the conflict, and the fact of the geographic boundaries separating the campus from the city, the riot left the students feeling vulnerable. And it is this sense of vulnerability that persisted in their outlook throughout the years of partitioning. In Remembered Histories, the 1946 episode itself and its aftermath become the source of a narrative of fear and anxiety. Their concern was that the boundary walls of the institution might be breached, that non-Muslims would cross the Katpula, would enter the university, and attack the students. There is significant variation in the tone of these narratives that I think is, is um, productive to look at, partly because it illuminates kind of the power of national narratives and exert on memory. Perhaps the most dramatic contrast appears in examining statements from Pakistani engineer Zakir Ali Khan, um, who was secretary, uh, settled in Pakistan, was secretary of the Old Boys Association in Pakistan from the 1960s until his death in 2012, and Aligarh University retired professor of English, Masudul Hassan. The experiences of these two men, even during their time as Aligarh students, was dramatically different. Khan was an avid sportsman, captain of the university hockey team, um, and he had access to the privileges that came with that position. Hassan, on the other hand, was studious and unathletic. His allegiance to the Muslim League ideology of Pakistan is now a source of regret, whereas it was the core of Khan's identity. During the uncertainty of 1946 and 47 in partition at Aligarh, both men were present on the campus and both described efforts to protect it. Masudul Hassan has written, oh, darn. Um, in 1946, when communal riots had broken out on a large scale in the country, one evening a rumor got around the university was to be attacked at night. Some night patrolmen got panicky and the university siren was sounded as a warning, but the students took it as a challenge and rushed out of the hostels, wielding, many of them even trembling with fear, the sticks from their mosquito nets. Some of the more prudent strategists were even said to have chosen the ground under the dining tables as a more advantageous field of operations. The proctor had a hard time of it, and it was with considerable difficulty that he could send the boys back to their hostels. Hassan's explanation characterizes the university as the victim of undifferentiated communal hatred, but he also shows students ready to respond with a show of force. The students rose up to defend their institution against challenge. He does not, however, classify the potential attack as retributive. Though the show of strength and the fear of victimization are closely linked, so there's a real ambivalence here between defiance and terror. In fact, many of them just ran to hide. <coughs> this explanation and its silences clearly shows the difficulties the university faced in 1946 and 47. The students' power had outgrown the university's capacity to manage it. And as a result, they had provoked a potential response much too large for the university to defend against. Zakir Ali Khan, by contrast, remembered, when we were in Aligarh, there were nights when the university was being attacked by the, villager, by the villages in which Hindus were living all around Aligarh. The Hindu mobs, it was a very rabid type of organization of Hindus, they were in mobs, organizing attacks on the university by villagers. And we used to guard the university. We used to travel in trucks and whatever transport all around the university periphery. We spent the nights together guarding the university. Khan remembers two significant aspects of this experience. First, the threat to Muslims from Hindus was so real that he remembers the campus actually being attacked by Hindu mobs. Second, he and his compatriots adopted a position of strength with regard to this threat. They did not cower under tables or hide inside the hostel. 
They traveled the university periphery together in solidarity to guard it from attack. The contrast between these, explana these two explanations is worth considering because Han's narrative contains a key factual inconsistency. Heidegger was not attacked during the 1947 partition, though several narrators described the threat to the university in 1946, the fear of attack in 1947, and one described the university's protective stance after partition when refugees began to come into Heidegger, telling me, quote, we were asked to safeguard our university in the night, and we put a searchlight on the roof of VM Hall, and we did duty up there at night. We watched, so there should not be any attack. Zakir Ali Khan's description of controlling the university is at its heart a narrative of triumph. He and his fellow <coughs> students faced the threat of attack with strength, and he has imagined an actual attack to prove that they were successful. This narrative sits easily with the <coughs> narrative of Muslim vulnerability in India, but it is fortified by the idea that Muslims could wield power, as they would in Pakistan. Hassan's explanation, however, reveals the fact that Muslim students felt vulnerable more consistent with Aligarh's post-47 stance, when the narrative of Muslim empowerment had worn away, and Aligarh once again seemed a Muslim outpost in the hinterlands. Uh, I thought there was another slide there, maybe not. Students had begun arriving in Aligarh in July to start the 1947-48 academic year, before the violence in Punjab made it clear that the two new states of India and Pakistan would be separated by a formal international boundary, and Pakistan would not function as a semi-autonomous Muslim region with a porous frontier or no border at all, as many had expected. Whether these students came from areas that became Pakistan or from other parts of India, the partition violence trapped them in the university. One narrator from Kanpur told me, I wrote to my father, I said, please call me back. I'm being frightened over here. And he said, why? You are a coward, boy? No, be there in the hospital. <laughs> what happens to the other students will happen to you also. And I think nothing will happen. Nothing has happened, he said. It was correct, but I was a lad and so much frightened with my other students. They were from far distance, so they could not get home easily. But I could go to Kanpur very easily. But he refused me. He said, what happens to others? It will happen to you also. He found encouragement in his father's instructions that evoked the solidarity of Aligarh's brotherhood in which both triumphs and tribulations were shared, but he was undoubtedly frightened by being forced to stay. It was not until the 1950s that Aligarh became one of the most riot-prone cities in Aligarh. But in remembering the events of 46 and 47, Aligarh boys described the fear of attack repeatedly. They were alert to the possibility that their security could be breached and increasingly conscious of their exposure as a Muslim institution surrounded by a Hindu majority. For Aligarh boys during this period, fear and anxiety arose from a serious disruption of the sources of authority that had previously served to protect them. The meaning of places in which they had learned to feel safe, to build solidarity, now changed irrevocably, and with it, their sense of belonging. When external authority deteriorated, the safest place appeared to be in the university itself. While students feared attack on the university, no one actually crossed the boundary into the university. One former student, Ahmed Saeed of Lucknow, explained why the students became so terrified. He told me, in 47, these communal riots were all around us. We used to read it in the newspapers. Naturally, we were scared, and we were in the center of it. All around, there were people belonging to the other communities, so we were scared. And there were threats also. So naturally, there were threats. He describes a situation in which Aligarh appears besieged, overwhelmed by forces of danger swirling all around. Aligarh, in his explanation, was the eye of the storm, the center of all animosity directed towards Muslims. That regional framing, so embedded in a history of strength, became a landscape of fear, as the space beyond Aligarh's boundary wall became strange and terrifying. The trains and railway lines that had defined their experiences became specific sites of trauma for them, especially because of the connections they represented to the terrifying space of the world beyond. Though their routes typically did not take them anywhere near border violence, where Muslims were targeted, the trains represented the arterial connections to that larger Muslim body, one in which any of our students were increasingly exposed. Their position was made more precarious by their distinct identity and sense of privilege, and as such, if they had to travel by train, um, they modified their behavior 
and appearance in a variety of ways to occlude their social location, religion, and relationship to Aliyar. To do this, they normally adopted one of two strategies, or sometimes a combination of both. They modified the markers of their appearance, or found company in a sense of security among other Muslims. Retired University uh, professor of history, uh, sorry, retired Delhi University professor of history, Mohammed Amin, said that he was advised, quote, to carry a book or something like that, and in the book, write the name Mahavir Prasad or Raghavla or something or the other. In other words, he attempted to impersonate a Hindu student by writing a recognizably Hindu name in his book when he traveled by train. Aligarh yeah. students shed the sharwani. These efforts to conceal identity reveal powerful anxiety and fear of violence. Aligarh boys for generations have flaunted their identity by proudly wearing their school uniform outside the university and entitled them to that privilege of traveling without a ticket. During the election campaign of 45 and 46, the Shermani was a mark of Aligarh's expanding influence. But once Pakistan became a reality, that identity exposed them to danger. If the Khar Alam Khan, who's a retired professor um, from, of museum studies at Aligarh, his narrative reveals more than any other the depth of this anxiety that fear caused for the students. He told me that he could not travel by train in the direction of Delhi away from, or in the direction of Delhi after the riots of 47. Though his father lived there, he only felt safe traveling away from Delhi, away from the specter of violence, but towards his home in Kayamganj in UP. Still, as he traveled, he sought the company of other Muslims and tried to hide his identity. Remarkably, he found an ally in the man who ran the toddy shop at the Hathras railway station. In Hathras, which is nearly 35 kilometers from Aligarh's protective reaches, Khan feared for his safety because he knew that in this direction, away from Delhi and Aligarh, there would be no Muslim. So he told me, outside the Hathra station was a store selling shut up. Shut up, you know? Country made liquor. A lot of people used to come and drink liquor over there. The bartender, the worker, he was called Pandit, and he used to have a ponytail. But he was a Muslim. I knew that. He was from my village. He had changed his name and all that because he had to live there in the liquor shop. And if he wasn't a pundit, his caste would be very low and nobody would drink. And he would, if he was a Muslim, then they would kill him. So having become a pundit, he stayed there. <laughs> and I was knowing this. I reached there at night and had to wait three hours for my connection. So I used to go out near this liquor shop to see if this man was there or not. He used to see me and give me a signal of recognition and I used to say something. Then I would sit near to him until the train would come after three hours, and he used to come and ask after me. This story illustrates the disorientation that partition created. Delhi, historic core of Muslim India, was cut off because of the potential for violence, despite the fact that his own father lived there. Once beyond the boundaries of Aligarh, neither the university nor his father's reputation could protect him. Yet as he moved away from those centers of the threat of violence, even the presence of a nominal Muslim, one who was also concealing his identity and masquerading as a high caste Hindu, created a sense of safety until the actual environs of home came into view. After departing from Hatras in the direction of his hometown, Khan began to, began to feel more comfortable because after three or four stations, he said, people began to recognize him as the son of a powerful landed family. Then he said, I was in my own territory, but what was really bad was I couldn't travel towards Delhi. If the Khar Alam here describes his sense of safety in Fayyambinj, describing it as his own territory, as in an earlier period, Shafi had called the railways our own. The entitlement of possession indicates a meaningful sense of security, the security of place. As partition shockwaves rumbled through Aligarh, these young men were forced to confront geographies of terror in the place that they had felt the most safe the campus of the university that had been designed expressly for their well-being and development. The dreams of Muslim solidarity that they had dreamt there were increasingly threatened by their connections to the world outside. And so, many of them gave it up. Narrators who stayed in India described the empty hostels, and indeed between 1946 and the 1947-48 school years, the student population of Aligarh University and its allied institutions, including the Muslim University High School and the Minto Circle Preparatory School, fell from over 6,000 to about 4,600. The annual vice chancellor's report notes that many teachers and students had been lost as they could not join through lack of communications. 
during the disruptions of 47. In the engineering college, the number of students returning for the session of 47-48 was about 50% of normal, and the number of undergraduates in the Faculty of Science overall dropped about 40%. Mohiuddin Khan told me that the remaining students felt this loss of students because the whole university campus became very quiet. This quiet, after the disruptions of 47, was not a comfort to the young men who remained. I'm almost done. The, the environment that Sir Sayed and other early leaders in Aligarh sought to cultivate prioritized the brotherhood of students residing within its walls. <clears throat> the Muslim League capitalized on this attitude of solidarity that resonated among other students, and the students were key to ensuring the creation of the Muslim homeland. But this homeland left the student body divided. Until the 1960s, Aligarh graduates continued to give up Aligarh to go to Pakistan. It is in the reflections of some of the former students on their decision to leave for Pakistan that their motives emerge most clearly. Without exception, it was a decision made quickly. The young people who had supported the League, even those who had worked for the elections, had made no advanced preparations to leave India. Ghulam Umar of the Pakistan Army remarked, My decision was in favor of Pakistan. For me, there was no two thoughts about it. And Bajadat Hussain, who had left Aligarh in 1944 and gone into training at the Indian Military Academy at Dehradun, noted that when he had the opportunity to choose between India and Pakistan, the choice was clear. He said, the fact is that I had made up my mind when Pakistan was established, and I have never regretted it. In retrospect, for those settled in Pakistan, its establishment was the fulfillment of the dream of Muslim solidarity that they had pursued in Aligarh and in support of the League. But for those who remained in India, Pakistan appeared not as the logical outcome of their actions, but as its opposite. It disrupted the meaning of Aligarh and left the institution on the margins of Muslim society for which its students had fought. The students together fought to achieve Pakistan, but in the event, only some chose Aligarh, and others chose the dream. And Mohammed Ali Johar apparently was one of them. <laughs> um, thank you. That's all I have. So, um, <coughs> like Mullis, I too begin with confession. <laughs> this seems to be the day for that. <laughs> And you will see why I start this way. I began this dissertation, and um, I've read every last word of it. I just am very diligent. If I'm asked to do something, I, I really take very seriously. And I began this dissertation, and I actually wondered after reading the first chapter, I thought, well, why is this dissertation one that leaves that out of it? Some of the material in the beginning is familiar, and I recounted very quickly that we know about Aligarh's first generation. David Lelyveld's canonical work on Aligarh's first generation remains canonical. Sayyid Ahmed Khan, born 1817 in Delhi, in, died in Aligarh in 1898, brought up in the Mughal court of Delhi, and when he was 20 years old, to the surprise of his family, joins the East India Company. Why? As a member of an elite, he saw some of the benefits of the bureaucratic sense of order and efficiency that the British had instituted in those parts of India they controlled directly. We know that when the rebellion broke out, he was in a small town called Bijnor, 80 miles from Delhi, arranged for the safe passage of the European residents. Believed in his early years that the British were bringing order to the country. He supported them, but the events of 1857, about which I'll spend a little bit of time, forced him, one might say, into a position that was both contradictory and logical. On the one hand, he needed to assert the loyalty of Muslims qua Muslims, on the other, he was critical of what the British had done. 1858, he wrote the Asbari Bahar Hind in 1860, a pamphlet of the loyal Mohammedans. Now, before 1857, British historical writing about India, we might say, was tinged with a certain admiration for the Mughals, combined with some pity about their decline. Alexander Dow's History of Hindustan, Jonathan Scott's History of the Deccan, and as one missionary, Bishop Heber, noted in the 1820s, many Muslims believed that the East India Company ruled in the name of the Mughal Emperor. But the events of 1857 changed that. Muslims are now not only a distinct community, but a community that's troublesome. As a religious community, who were the Muslims? William Moyer wrote The Life of Muhammad, for instance, helped to foster the myth that Muslims were 
armed as always with a sword in one hand and a Quran in the other. You wonder they couldn't have had very much mobility. <laughs> so it was John Lawrence, resident of Delhi, wrote to the Governor General, and I'm quoting, the Mohammedans of the regular cavalry when they have broken out have displayed a more active, vindictive, and <coughs> fanatic spirit than the Hindus. But these traits are characteristic of the race. Note that Muslims in this account are written off as a race. So 1857, there is a conversation, post-1857, there is a different conversation. The terms of the debate change. In previous writings, Muslims are the heirs of a now tired empire. The sick man of Europe will emerge a little later, apropos of the Ottomans. After 1857, there is a conversation about their congenital treachery, congenital ingratitude. And it is in light of this kind of perception of Muslims that you have to see elite Muslims, so say that with Khan in particular, responding in ways which make the claim that Muslims are far from untrustworthy, perfectly capable of loyalty. Today, this seems like an attempt to appease a colonial power in terms like loyalism and nationalism, a bandied about terms that I would urge a little caution with, particularly when writing about Muslims here. Um, Loyalism, nationalism, it's a little more than loyalism and nationalism because in effect, post-1857, the entire community has been set aside too poor. An example, in the aftermath of 1857, the poet Khalid wrote here, he's talking about Delhi, there is a vast ocean of blood before me. God alone knows what more I shall have to behold. 82-year-old Bahadur Shah is tried, exiled to Rangoon, his sons shot in front of him, 24 members of his family tried and executed. Zahir Behlavi wrote in something called Dastani Dadar, the English soldiers, I'm quoting, began to shoot whomsoever they met along the way, and he notes, much like your interlocutors, he's actually naming people as well. Mia Muhammad Amin Panjakash, an excellent writer, Malvi Imam Bakshabhai, along with his two sons arrested, taken to Rajkhat Gate. They were shot dead, their dead bodies thrown into the Jamna. In the weeks following the rebellion, for instance, when British authorities held Delhi, every citizen who wanted to return after expulsion had to pay a fine, but Muslims paid 25% of the value of their real property, Hindus paid 10%. You see an early policy of dividing communities that in 1857 had reveled as one, a differential punishment for the same crime. Palmerston wrote to the Governor General Lord Canning that every civil building connected with Mohammedan tradition should be leveled to the ground without, I quote, regard to antiquarian veneration or artistic predilection. Early on in the rebellion, 30th May 1857, a colonial act provided for punishment by death and confiscation of property of all persons guilty of rebellion. An act in the next month, in June, extended it to all those who incited mutiny or rebellion. And for a decade after the rebellion, British attitudes in their writing express their dualism of their recognition of this Muslim community, distinct, similar to the Hindu community, on the one hand, because they were bound fanatically to their religion, but a community that now needed to be repressed, suppressed, for its role in a political rebellion. And so, as Bhavi Bakhavate Hind, I'll finish the history lecture very quickly, I promise. Mm -hmm. I did want to get to why it was that I might have begun with disappointment but I didn't end with it. So, Sayyid Ahmed Khan recognizes 1857 as a classic revolt. Classic revolt. Five acts of rebellion, individually or collectively, amounted to a revolt. What were those? The subjects armed opposition to the government. The disregard of the government's orders with a view to resisting its authority. Aiding and abetting the government's opponents. Engaging in and fighting indicating disregard for the government's role. This one's an art one, but we let it go. Yes, a infighting, why is this classic? It's a descriptive one, perhaps not a prescriptive one. And the last one, eliminating from one's heart loyalty for the government and refraining from helping it in crisis. In 1857, Sir Sayyid said, there was not one of these forms of rebellion which did not find a place. What was his point? That the sort of one theory, one cause theory, the British were putting out in the post-1857 rebellion it was sort of spurious. There were many causes, according to him. People were apprehensive of the East India Company's intentions. Their laws were at odds 
with the way people actually lived. They had no information about what afflicted the people. The inefficient management and disaffection of the army, the government's abandonment of good government. In effect, he wrote about the whole colonial apparatus of colonialism, yes? Unlike former Muslim rulers of India, the British had settled in India temporarily and separately from the Indians, from Hindus, from Muslims, from Sikhs, everybody. And so after an experience that would horrify us all, I'm, I'm, I'm not assuming everybody knows this, but you, Amber, so let me recount it, where he goes off to the British Library, and he goes off to the British Library to consult records that had been lifted after the 1857 revolt, and notes that in an ethnological work, some of his associates and friends are listed as anthropological specimens. In 1875, uncoincidentally, the year that the Arya Samaj is founded, which explains a good deal about the rhetoric that gets ramped up between 40 and 45, he founds the Mohammedan Anglo-Oriental College. Amber didn't say very much about this because it's all in her dissertation. But let me tell you, the curriculum, it'll, it'll terrify all of us here, even you, Barbara, you know, <laughs> despite your languages. The curriculum is that Arabic or Persian would be the language of literature, logic, and philosophy. Urdu, the language of history, geography, science, and mathematics. And English would be the second language. The University of Chicago's curriculum looks really weak compared to this. <laughs> what is remarkable about this curriculum, in theory, is that languages were not taught simply as languages, but as mediums of instruction, media, more correctly. It didn't work. The big disappointment for him was that students actually switched to English and didn't want to do Although, can you imagine doing literature, logic, philosophy in one language, history, geography, science, math in another, and then doing English? Okay. 1883, he recruits two extraordinary men, Theodore Beck and Mohammed Shibli Nomani. And Beck transforms the curriculum of the AMU, now I'm calling it AMU, it wasn't AMU, it was the Mohammedan Anglo Oriental College, transforms the curriculum into, in history. He adds political theory and literature. And Shibli Nomani begins as a teacher of Persian, assisting with Arabic. He uses history to write about the early history of Islam, writes on people like Ibn Khaldun. Used a great deal of data, geographical, etymological, and a master. He was of the new style of Urdu prose. Like Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, he wrote primarily against European criticisms. He showed that Parva and Jazia, imposed by non -Muslim, on non-Muslims by some rulers, were pre-Islamic in origin. They'd been used, but were not part and parcel of the religion per se. He wrote of the underlying tolerance of Muslim rule towards non-Muslims, primarily in terms of Middle Eastern Christians and Jews, but it was obviously aimed at the British and in reference to what they were doing. 1891 started a journal in Urdu and English. What, could what got redefined here was that Aligarh was not just any college not just any college, it was iconic. It was a movement. It was a Muslim college, but a college for Muslims and a college for non-Muslims as well. Aligarh, to repeat this, was iconic. And with apologies to Barbara Metcalf, because she's in the audience, more so than Deoband of Hiram Imahel, for a lot of reasons. Aligarh was a movement, to paraphrase Aretha Franklin, a movement that captured the imagination of the young, gifted, and Muslim. The Muslims, the Muslim imagination that it captured, were culturally Muslim, whether they were secular, agnostic, or devout, who had an eye to the future as leaders in a new nation that wasn't yet, did not yet have shape. Not simply melancholic and tired nostalgists for the past, for a Mughal past. This was Aligarh's first generation. So imagine my surprise when in chapter 3, although she doesn't term it as such, I read the memories of Aligarh's last generation. The same group of elite Muslim men working through their memories, primarily of the disappointment of nationalism. Nationalism here in Abbas's work is not simply Indian nationalism, and she is at pains to ensure that her readers do not and cannot charge her but taking any nationalist standpoint. I'm sorry, I'm going to move some of this around. Papers doing it really good. Okay. That her readers do not and cannot charge her with taking any nationalist standpoint, Indian, Pakistani, or Bangladeshi. And this is an enormous strength of her work, of the questions that she has asked her interlocutors, of the sort of wealth of oral history 
in this work of her sifting through of their answers to give us something both interesting, much of which she's told us, but let me add to that something that's also brave. Why brave, you might ask? Well, the literature on partition, as we know here, is about the horrors that are perpetrated primarily on the bodies of women. I don't need to rehearse it here. Scholars, Urvashi Bhutalia, Ritu Menendyam, Pandey Vinadas, Nenika Mukherjee, Yasmin Saikia, more controversially, Shabila Bose, and many, many more have made it a very long-standing project to ensure that we never forget the horrors visited on women during partition. It's been dealt with in fiction, we know this from Manto, we know it from the poetry of fairs, we know it from extraordinary movies like Darabhava, where we see Balraj Sani in a role as a father who sees his future and that of his children get narrower and narrower, his daughter in particular, in an India in which the politics of the British government, the International Congress and the All India Muslim League, but also the politics of the RSS, the Hindu Mahasabha, the jamaat e islam the Justice Party, the Communist Party, and so on, culminate in the subcontinent's vivisection, as it has been called. Now, partition has been understood variously. It's been understood as an aberration of failure, a success, a cynical move by the British, a last-ditch attempt by a government that beats a hasty and undignified and unthinking retreat, and perhaps most damagingly, partition has been thought of as a moment. Abbas enters this well-plowed field with a rather different dissertation, her focus is on Aligarh's lost generation. Her argument that partition is a process that begins early and continues to the present day. That we need to see partition as a process, not as a moment, not as an aberration, not a success, not as failure. And I must confess that as a member of a generation for whom partition was very real, I grew up in some of the places you're talking about, in particular Bareilly and Muradabad and Ghaziabad, and uh, as somebody whose father was born and brought up in Lahore and had to move to India as somebody whose friends, Amir Mufti in particular, whose parents lived in Muradabad and made the other journey. This strikes a very personal chord. And yet, I was rebuked by Abbas to not think of partition in all of the ways that I would think of it as my generation, as you know, the British draw the line in the sand, late Miki Chui Latir, or as a moment of cataclysmic violence, Abbas encourages us to think differently about this. What she is able to do in particular is with a very fine paintbrush, paint for us, the cultural and sociological history of the Alibar Muslim universities, elites, the elites modeled after the Sayyid Ahmed Khan and his curriculum, which I read out to you. In chapters 4, 5, and 6, those of you who have not read the dissertation, I urge you to read in particular chapters 4, 5, and 6, because she paints for us with a very fine paintbrush the lives of these very privileged, yes, very privileged, make no mistake, traveling without train tickets is not the mark of the subaltern. It is the mark of the opposite of these very privileged, elite, young Muslim men. Their sense of privilege, their sense of purpose, their sense of activity, and their sense of spatial privilege extending Delhi, Bareilly, Aligarh. Why Delhi, Bareilly, Ali, Aligarh, Agra? Well, because the street food in Bareilly was extraordinary, as were the marketplaces. Okay. Um, epitomized in, in many, many movies and many songs. Um, but this sense of privilege exemplified as well in other movies. Movies, I think, come in very handy for you. Chavi um, Chand, for instance, or Mira Saya, a number of movies made about the kind of cultural milieu in which this group of elite young Muslim men and women found themselves with great purpose and courage. And even as these men participated or didn't in the activities of the Old Muslim League, what she paints for us is rather remarkable. It's almost like a romantic bubble, yes, in the midst of turmoil, a romantic bubble of Aligarh Muslim University and gives us the reasons why it remains iconic. Indeed, this institution in which for a rather extended period of time, all things were possible. Everything was possible. It was the Muslim Cambridge. 
young elite men who were going to take their rightful place in a modern India without giving up anything, not their past, not their Mughal past, not their future, not their Shivani's, not their affairs, nothing, yes? Some of whom stayed in India, some who went to Pakistan, but they were affected, and their memories were affected by partition, even as Aligarh itself saw no partition violence. And she does this in a way which disallows somebody from me from repeating, but Aligarh did not see any violence compared to so many other places. What she persuades us is that despite that, the memories of these Aligarhis, Aligarhians as you're calling them, are important enough for us to take seriously. The political history we know well, in abstraction perhaps, of elite politics, of, of these two wonderful elite men, Nehru and Jinnah, duking it out over the issues of the cabinet mission plan and, and so on and so forth. What she gives us is that political period peopled through her oral interviews with all of these Aligarians. So what happens to them? The politics of the elections in 1937 throws them into a world where they are recruited, this time by the All India Muslim League. Note, of course, that Mahmoud and Shokat Ali Khan were also Aligarh, and they were instrumental in the Khilafat movement and very much a part um, of that kind of politics together with Gandhi. Post-1937 politics changes this a little bit and brings with it an extreme sense of alienation post-partition from a familiar world where once their Shaivanis marked them as Aligarhis, but in a vastly transformed North India, now dominated by fear, mistrust, communal tension. But Aligarh itself is strikingly diverse. And the interviews, for instance, I particularly like the interviews with Irfan Habib for all kinds of reasons, yes, um, would certainly demonstrate that. Indeed, Habib Saab's recollection of his father's devotion to Gandhi would perhaps bear more attention to. And I say that because for all that it is, I think, currently fashionable to demonize Gandhi, we should know that in 1946-1947, from the beginning of Direct Action Day, shall we say, to 1947, mid-1947, he was able to do what no other leader was able to do, which is quell the violence, yes? From his marching through Noakhali to the fast in Delhi. And the question that still needs answering, which I'm sure is in your oral interviews and hopefully will be in your book, is that if he was so despised, and despised Gandhi was by Jinnah, by Bose, by Peria, by Ambedkar, I have a couple of students in my class and they can all attest to this, yes, by the communists, why was he still someone that Habib Saab could speak of with such devotion? Which leads to a difficult question, and I'll just pose this, because you've asked some incredibly difficult questions of your interlocutors through this dissertation, is that what is the question of the minority. Jinnah wanted an undivided Bengal and an undivided Pajal. In place of this, he got a moth-eaten, maimed, and mutilated Pakistan. But what was the work that was done by Jinnah, by the Muslim League, to in fact recruit the minority population, which in an undivided subcontinent would have been a sizable minority in a confederating Pakistan? It's not a comfortable question. I don't ask it lightly. Because what emerges from this question, from this dissertation, is a question that can, in fact, be pursued. And you do it extraordinarily well in chapters <coughs> 5 and 6. In all of the ways, shall we say, that India, or modern India, failed to protect a minority, a Muslim minority, that claimed then, now, during partition, post-partition, that its support of the Muslim League was never about separatism, with which it was charged let alone about partition, because partition wasn't the issue in 1940. But it was about the need for safety, for assurance, for security, the right to religion of a sizable minority population. And here, in all of the ways India failed, you can see Bangladesh's separation from Pakistan in almost exactly the same way. The starting of the language of the ungrateful minority, the recollections of the army officers, and that you note the continued use of the language of the stereotyping of the effeminate Bengali, which is a hundred years old, at least by then. The continued use of the language of stereotyping about the effeminate Bengalis. The massacres, and here the horrible irony is that the massacres are in a university in Dhaka, yes? Mm. And you begin with Aligarh Muslim University. And of course, the horrors primarily on and through the bodies of women is startlingly similar 
to the ways in which the subcontinent was first divided. It's as if all of India's mistakes were made anew by Pakistan, despite the fact that it had come into being in large part to protect and guard a minority from majoritarian politics. And in, 17, in 1971, we see again in a terrible reenactment of Marx's claim that history happens twice, the first time is tragedy, the second time is farce, perhaps a slight change that history always happens tragically, first for Muslims in India and the second time for their Golden Muslims in Pakistan. What emerges from this dissertation in which partition is written about from an unlikely group, an unlikely group, and this is why it is brave, after all, young elite men, Muslim or Hindu, are not who we think of as the typical victims of partition. We see, poignantly, through their memories, that nations disappoint, and nationalism disappoints. India disappointed, Indian nationalism disappointed, post-47 Indian nationalism continues to disappoint, Pakistani nationalism disappoints, and now we see Bangladeshi nationalism disappointing. Why is this? Because the creation of nations creates minorities. And here I will end by simply congratulating Dr. Rabas for showing us that Jinnah's replacement, however confusing it might have been at the time, and to make no mistake for anyone who teaches the period between 1940 and 1947, as I do and have done for almost 20 years now, it is immensely confusing what Jinnah meant by nation and what he meant by minority. Regardless of how confusing that would be, the language of the minority, but the language of a nation in an undivided subcontinent, remained in many ways the hail for many of these young men that Dr. Abbas speaks of with great poignancy. There are questions that I have for her, but I think I might pose them to her another time. For now, I wanted to describe this dissertation for you, because she only described a small part. And so that I could give you the larger frame in which the, the, the talk that Dr. Abbas gave you fits, so that I could leave the floor for you to ask some questions. Thank you. Uh, what we will do right now is perhaps uh, ask Dr. Abbas to come on the podium. We have uh, Q&A for about 20 minutes. Is that correct? And I will start taking hands and uh, keeping track of whose hands have gone up. Uh, well, before Dr. Bakley has to leave, thank you for that expansive review of, of all the stuff I couldn't get to. <laughs> thank you, I appreciate it, and I appreciate your time. Welcome. Questions from the audience? Barbara. Barbara yeah. Oh, no, I'm sure there are many other questions, but it, first of all, enormous thank you. I mean, it really was a pleasure to hear this material. And it is remarkably timely. I think there are a whole set of people now working around this, this field, a uh, new book on Iqbal and the book that I have just finished reading, so it's really in my mind, which is what I want to ask you about, which is Thank you to La Of course, to La La. Uh, And it's a book, for those of you who don't know, called Creating, new Medina, mm -hmm. uh, Creating a New Medina. And the Oligar students are enormously important. Mm -hmm. Basically, the Muslim League is fractured, infighting, mm -hmm. Without the Muslim League, he argues, and the ulama who come to his rescue, uh, or the League's rescue, there never would have been the support within the critical um, province of, of Uttar Pradesh. And so, for me, I think the missing piece in that argument is fear, actually. But I wonder about the other side, the utopian vision. At the very end of your talk, you talked about the students being driven by a vision of Muslim solidarity. But could you elaborate on that and tell us more what folks you talked to talked about, what they thought they were fighting for? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I had a chance to um, meet Beckett when he was at the Institute for Historical Studies at Texas, and so I had a chance to respond to some early versions of his work. I haven't read um, his book yet. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's on my list for the right. summer. But I know, I know his argument a little bit, and, um, and I think, one of the things that he does in the book that's really important, and, and one of the spaces I'm also trying to occupy is sort of talking about the UP, you know, in this period, because of course we have excellent work yours and, and that of others that talks about an earlier period, um, and we're just now getting to the 40s, and partly because it's painful. Um, it's painful for people to remember 
the, the tensions that um, that have created the movement um, for for Pakistan. So. Um, I think I just totally forgot your question. <laughs> what, what, what was there a content to this? Oh, yes, the interviews. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, thank you. Sure. I've been accused of loving my interviews a little bit too much in my writing. Um, I, I know it might seem tiresome to hear those voices again and again, but to me, they really are the heart of why I'm there. And um, I hear all kinds of things. It's very difficult to ask somebody now, what were you after? Um, and I think one of the things that I argue in, in the dissertation is actually that the only way to really understand what people were after is to separate the outcome from the desire for Pakistan. So if we can only think about the, the demand for Pakistan within the context of the fact that Pakistan was created, um, that it, it casts a, a pretty thick shadow mm -hmm. on the experiences and many of the um, former students who I interviewed in India express regret. Some of them denied their affiliations with the League. Um, but it's really clear that, and I, I have an, an article out um, in South Asian History and Culture that kind of addresses this, that the, um, I argue that the political environment that Aligarh and, and Dr. Pakley referred to this, the earlier movement of the Khilafat movement, that these were all movements about Muslim solidarity, about building community, and that the values of the Aligarh University were the ones that, um, that they saw reflected in these political movements that sought to empower Muslims. So there was a real sense of, um, of intimacy between the students and the political movements that sought to give Muslims power. When I listen to them talk about those experiences, that's what I hear. They talk about, you know, electioneering was fun. They loved going, they loved traveling by train. They, um, they talk about being with other students. They talk about meeting communities and they felt really important. That's a big thing, you know, when we think about the other students. They were college students who were being told, like, you are the heart, you are Muslim India. You have to lead this charge towards creating a future for the Muslims of the subcontinent. And that was um, exciting for them. And, um, and so some of them in India, for instance, have now sort of ducked back under that shadow and said, um, it was just youthful enthusiasm. I, I was just swept up because there was a lot of excitement and, and I just went along with it. But many of them also express um, a sense of trepidation even now that their credentials would be um, impugned if it was publicly known that they had supported the League and I had um, some narrators deny their involvement, although I have other documents that, that show me exactly the ways in which they were involved and so some of the people who spoke to me I've chosen not to identify because that um, fear remains palpable for them um, that would make them change the way they spoke. Um, in Pakistan, there's this real sense, you know, it's hard to get through the story about, um, about what you wanted in Pakistan when you're in Pakistan. Um, because there's, a, sense, there's a, a triumphalism associated with the realization of that dream. But for many of the narrators that I spoke to, they also express a real sense of regret about how Pakistan has turned out. Um, they feel disappointed, they feel marginalized. It's hard to imagine the Aligarh man being marginalized, but they feel that way, and that's real. That's, that's their experience. Um, so I think one of the things that I've tried to do in the dissertation is to explore the many possibilities. And, I, um, and, and this is one of the, the reasons it's a great moment to be in, um, in a, a field of scholars who are talking about partition because I think, um, well, and these politics, one of the things that's happening is that the field is being diversified. We now have histories of partition from you know, Sindhi Hindus, and we have more and more coming out about Bengal. Uthi Sen's writing about um, you know, Bengali refugees being resettled in the Andaman Islands, and um, we now are starting to get to fill in this space of UP that maybe enough time has elapsed that we can delve back into these experiences and fill them with substance. Um, so that we don't have some vague understanding of what people were up to, but we can actually find out. And to me, the voices are part of that. Thank you. Uh, did you get a sense of uh, the students from Aligarh who were involved in the movement? 
and in a sense they were involved in the movement uh, with Muslim League for Pakistan. Did you get a sense of what kind of Pakistan they were thinking about on a, in a religious context? I mean, were they ex expecting or estimating that it would be a, a very religious Pakistan or more of a secular Pakistan? Yeah, that's a great question. It's the big question. I mean, I think that's the question that everyone in Pakistan would like answering. Even now, um, I've been teaching this this week um, in my modern South Asia class, having students, you know, well, what does it mean to read Jinnah's, you know, address to the Constituent Assembly and his other speeches talking about protection of minorities and secularism, and also to realize that his vision of belonging in Pakistan was an assimilationist vision. Um, it's very similar, if you remember Aftab Ahmed Khan's comments at the beginning of this, hundreds of students coming from lots of different places, if properly disciplined, can be crafted into something successful. That's actually a very similar